Hey guys, we just landed here in Seattle, Washington, our beautiful North Point, Washington facility. First of all, we just want to say thanks for joining us on this journey. Anything you want to say real quick, Big John? I uh, appreciate the support, and uh, we got a lot of great episodes coming your way, so be sure to check them out, show us some love on all the different media platforms, YouTube, podcasts, all that good stuff. Spotify, Spotify. Stitcher, Spotify. iTunes. Absolutely. Next few episodes are going to be showcasing our amazing North Point, Washington staff, as well as some of the alumni that have graduated from this facility, as well as North Point, Idaho, that live in the Washington State area. Yeah, it's going to be a real good time. guys. Welcome to No Way But North, where we talk about the miracles of recovery and the tools used to achieve them. As always, I am joined by my co-host, Big John Meldrum. I'm really surprised you didn't throw any shade at me this morning. Oh, I did say as always. I didn't say not as always. Yeah. You're slipping in your games too early for you. Uh, I know. I'm, we're not used to recording this early. And we're also not used to recording here in Washington in this beautiful green room we have at our Washington facility. I mean, <laughs> like wherever I go, it. I just make it work. That I, that was so far of a reach. I don't even know how you got there. I mean, that was that was out there, man. Listen, as we progress throughout the day, they'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how you feeling today? I mean, I'm ready to go. Let's kick yeah. this. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, so before we get going, as always, please make sure you hit that like button, that subscribe button. Uh, it helps us reach more people. It helps us share a message of recovery um, and the tools used to achieve them. Uh, guys, we are really excited. Our first guest in this Washington trip is Heidi. Um, she's our first Washington alumni that we're interviewing. We're really, really excited to hear her story um, and also what it was like to be here at this North Point Washington facility because it's not as good as being here in Idaho with us, but I'm sure it's almost. It's pretty close, right? I mean... Definitely. <laughs> right answer. Right here. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, guys, Heidi brought a quote for us today, and I'm surprised we haven't had a quote by this guy yet. So I'm actually pretty – I like this quote a lot. Hmm. I learned I had no need to feel ashamed, that I could make amends for the wrongs I had done, that I could address the fear I had always fled, that I could reevaluate my feeling of worthlessness. Russell Brand. So when you hear that quote, why that quote? Why did you bring that for us? What does that mean for you? Well, I just write, like that he's a rocker kind of guy, mm -hmm. and he's he's down to earth, and yeah. he's willing to change, and and isn't all full of himself, you know, like yeah. all those celebrities out there, and, yeah. and just wants to grow all the time, and isn't all about money anymore, and, mm -hmm. and all about spirituality and growing. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. People, you've talked, you said he's down to earth, and if you hear him talk, he doesn't sound down to earth at no. all. But if you actually like pay attention to the things that he's saying. He's probably one of the most grounded individuals yeah. that you'll ever actually see on TV. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I mean, for me, this is just like, this is what every person in long-term recovery goes through, right? That I don't need to feel ashamed of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, I can make amends and make up for what I did wrong. Um, I can address fear and I can like not feel like a worthless pile of garbage. Um, so I think that's just a really nice summed up way to say what happens in the recovery process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What about you? God, he makes me read it. You've seen the podcast, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that I had no need to feel ashamed, that I could make amends for the wrongs I had done, that I could address the fear I had always fled, and that I could reevaluate my feelings of worthlessness. Russell Brand. I mean, like, you you hit it right on the head. Like, it's, it's this idea of letting go of that shame and that guilt. Um, I think when... We start dealing with them like early recovery, especially at like North Point. Um, you see so many people come in and they're holding on to such large amount of guilt and shame. And like that's like yeah. the one thing that they can't break past. Or like, how can I forgive myself yeah. and get better when like I did all these terrible things? And so that's that's kind of my idea is like self forgiveness type thing. I love it. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, we're going to get into Heidi's story. Um, let's just start with childhood. I know you you had a military dad, so you moved around a lot. Um, how was your relationship with your parents going through that? Um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So my dad was actually, um, he was a pastor. Oh, um, okay. That's yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. I don't know where I got military um, dad. Sorry. That's where I was in the military. You yeah. were in the military. Yeah. That's right. Thank you for <laughs> sure. I, knew. I was like, appreciate it. Maybe, right? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the service. Yeah. Yeah. So my dad was a <laughs> pastor. Um, and so moved around a whole lot in his <laughs> early days. Um, so started out growing up all over, yeah. um, 
from Iowa to down south to the Midwest. Where so you I saw a up. lot of culture shock and, and that kind of stuff? Or were you kind of too young? To I would really... say I was too young. Okay. Um, it was more, you know, I was a child yeah. learning to talk with a oh, twang okay. and, you know, okay. <laughs> having a southern drawl. My favorite place to live, uh, well, I would say Washington. I've lived here for so long now, but uh, Indiana, I, you know, there's not a lot to do, but I like the slow life and mm. not a lot of traffic and I just being imagine. able to have it's land <laughs> and affordable. Affordable yeah. land. Yes. <laughs> for sure. So what kind of stuff do you remember from from that period of your life? So the moving around, um, I'm assuming it was pretty hard to make friends, right? I hear that a lot from like military people that move around a lot as a kid. They, it's mm -hmm. hard for them to make friends. They weren't in the military. Her dad was a pastor. No, but kids it's the that same. have moved around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm messing with you. <laughs> I gotta keep it on your toes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, what was that experience like? Obviously hard to make friends. Um, what kind of other stuff do you remember from that time of your life? Well, since I grew up in a very religious home, it was very structured. Okay. And so it was a lot of family time. Yep. Um, when I was younger, it was just my sister and I, and so we were very close. Okay. Um, we did have friends, um, but we didn't have sleepovers or yeah. anything like that. Okay. Very structured. Very straight. structured, everything church-related. Mm. Okay. So church activities, going over to church family dinners and things like that. Okay. Okay, um, and then so how long did you, when did you stop moving around? I would have been, well, it kind of slowed down once I got into first kindergarten, first okay. grade for okay. a while, um, and then really slowed down after fifth grade. Okay, cool. Um, so, and then relationship with your parents, too. I know you talked about your relationship with your parents, as with everybody, really kind of formed um, who you are and, and later on your addiction, and now it sounds like your recovery as well. Um, so... What, yeah, what was that relationship like with your parents? So my relationship with my parents, it's kind of night and day between the two. I was always very, very close with my dad. Mm -hmm. um, he's a very loving, kind of like a teddy bear kind of guy, very emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom is the opposite. She's very closed off, no emotions, doesn't cry, you know, hides mm -hmm. and has this wall. wall of everything is perfect in my life, even if it's not kind of thing and so that's how she raised me it, it wasn't very loving no hugs or anything those all came from my father do you feel like as you got older which parent did you take more after Especially that's an interesting question because I feel like that's kind of 50 50 okay. um, I would best. say uh, probably naturally it's probably like my mother Okay. But I don't like to be that way. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, so I, I, I try very like hard that. to be more like my father. Well, and then that act of addiction, I just feel like it's easier to, to have that that cold front, right? Then, like, mm -hmm. nobody really challenges me or everything's good. Yes. Everything's yes. perfect, right? Yeah, yes. for sure. So walk me through a little bit just kind of the rest of your childhood. So you slowed down after fifth grade. Um, I know your dad ended up leaving. Yeah, so my dad um, left in fourth, I was in fourth grade, okay. and um, he uh, cheated on my mom, and okay. um, yeah, as you know, in the church, so that's a big no-no, mm -hmm. so he got kicked out of the church, and um, life became pretty hard. We were still involved, very involved in the church, but it's almost like we were kind of shunned mm -hmm. because of my father's mm -hmm. mistakes, um, and so it was a very hard time for me um, because he all of his family is from the Pacific Northwest. And so he moved back out to Washington. Okay. And so never saw him very much mm -hmm. anymore. Well, and he was kind of the, like you said, the hugs and kisses kind of mm -hmm. parent. Oh, so yes. So I can imagine that would be really I was, hard. I was very angry. I, wa I wanted to live with him, you yeah. know, but there wasn't even a question of that. It's yeah. a, you're going to stay with your mother. Yep. Yeah. So. How old were you when that happened? Uh, so fourth grade, that would be like, what, maybe nine? Yeah, nine, ten. Nine, yeah. ten. About the same as my daughter. Yeah, yeah. So right about when puberty kind of starts. Okay. So. so then what was like life after that? Or like life? Life, <sighs> like, 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 life. 
my I life completely changed. So mm-hmm. my brother at that time was only two. How many siblings do you have? I have two. So okay. my sister is 20 months younger than me, and my brother is a little over seven years okay. younger. Okay. Yeah. So um, completely changed. I'm the oldest child, and so my mom became, you know, a single mom. Mm-hmm. My dad at the time just completely disappeared. No money coming in or yeah. anything. Um, and so she was out working all the time. And so I kind of got left with the responsibilities of Mm -hmm. making sure dinner was ready. And I remember in that first year I would have to make dinner, but I wasn't allowed to use the stove when she wasn't home. So it was all microwave food. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) You took over as, as a parent though, for your younger siblings. Yeah. I I mean, I had the responsibility responsibility, of, of being able to, you know, spank my brother, you know, (laughs) discipline him. You know, back then I never did that, but he was a very good child. Okay. But putting my, my putting old, him to yeah. bed, you know, putting him to bed, making sure he had his bath and getting stuff, dressed and, in the morning. Yes, and yeah. I would hate to give my oldest son like the ability to spank his siblings because like it would happen all the time. He'd beat them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We got into a lot of marker fights. That was our way of. Um, uh, marker fights. Yes, we I've would get never heard of marker that. fights, and then it was like, oh, mom is going to be home probably soon. Rush and put him in the bath and try to scrub it off. And I yes. feel like I'm, we're going to take that to work. <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> just marker him on the back of the neck. Yeah, he'll just sit on me and just draw on my face. Yeah. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> um, okay, so you took over responsibilities. Um, so, I mean, how did that progress? What kind of, how did that lead forward um, going into junior high, high school, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So, you know, I talked about earlier, my mom having that wall mm-hmm. front and, and that's really where I learned it from is from that point on having to be the yeah. oldest sibling and take on those responsibilities and, and knowing the money situation and, mm-hmm. and especially towards the end yeah. of the month and not yeah, that's knowing, scary for, you know, yeah. Yeah, you know, I put on that wall and had to make sure, you know, I was okay, even though inside I wasn't, and you know. uh, And still go to school. Still go to school. I was active in sports. That was pretty much my life was school and sports. And I did really well in school, Mm -hmm. and and I always loved different kinds of sports and music. And uh, What kind of stuff did you play sports and music-wise? Oh, I played uh, basketball, softball nice. um, when I was younger, soccer. Okay. Um, I did some gymnastics. Um, That's jack of all trades. Did I say volleyball? No, you <laughs> not. Volleyball. Nice. Um, and did you play any instruments? I did. I played trumpet in middle school. Nice. And so I was in band and jazz band. And, Very cool. And, yeah, so you stayed all like, high school. between that kids or your siblings very active yeah skateboarding yeah i always skateboarded or rode my bike to all the events to school nice and, yeah yeah what's that what's that family role the hero the hero yeah definitely you're fitting that to a mm-hmm. t yes so definitely. very cool or not cool but very that's just it's interesting to me when i can like it's very clear that that's being played out i didn't realize how like how that happens in every family, but you can well, totally for look sure. at a family. Well, I think I think you see it. <laughs> you can take a, you can take a role, but I think you see more of those roles become more like prevalent when you have multiple children in the family. Mm-hmm. Like I was an only child, so like it was super easy. You for played me. all three. Yeah, roles. I could do whatever I wanted, right? <laughs> but then like you have somebody that has like three or four siblings, right? Then mm-hmm. you have like the hero and the lost child and the mediator mascot. and the mascot. And, and so, yeah, you'll see those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so then, so going through school, um, what were your relationships with your friends like? Because now you've kind of settled in a spot, right? So what's mm-hmm. your social life like? What's So through middle school, I would say I was pretty social okay. um, because I was so active in sports. Yep. Uh, and then when I hit freshman year, I started – moving around uh, again a little bit more just in the town that I was in okay so high school I went I went to two different schools in the okay. first uh, freshman and sophomore year okay and I started to kind of close off at that time um, was there anything else triggering that do you think yes definitely that's uh, when so I've always known I was gay from the time I mm. hit puberty just from 
having dreams and mm -hmm. stuff. So I kind of always knew. And so that was a huge struggle for me um, with my religious background yeah, totally. and everything. And so I really hated myself mm -hmm. during that period. Just conflicting messages between the church and sexuality and all that stuff. Oh, yes. And I tested the waters, um, you know, by going to my church and saying, you know, I think I know somebody that is gay. And they were immediately, you know, <laughs> stay away from them. All that uh, stuff, tell me yeah. who they are so we can talk to their parents and try to get them, you know, Straight. do the gay conversion therapy. Oh. And I, so I knew from that point on, don't that is a brutal don't therapy. do anything. Keep it a secret. Yeah. And so that definitely changed my social life For because sure, yeah. I didn't feel like I could be myself anymore. When when you when you had come to the idea of like understanding your sexuality and, and knowing that you were gay, did you try to pre present as straight to make it seem like it wasn't you weren't gay? I did. I had several boyfriends mm. and um, from middle school through most of high school. How did that make you feel like in doing something that you knew you didn't want, but you were doing it to appease other people? Oh, I, I hated myself. So that's when I started getting into self harming because it's the, it was the only way I could feel better, you know, to yeah. get rid of those, the pain, yeah. um, and, uh, to not struggle so much in real life. You know, um, it's really hard to describe what self harm is feels I like I would say it's like it's like an idea of when you cut or you see that that blood it's like a it's like a rush it's like an endorphin rush and like you the anxiety settles it's like you've seen it you feel that sharp pinch or that pain if you're cutting right yeah. and then you see the blood and it's just like a your body like relaxes finally so it was interesting so I was in so I did I I was committed to mental hospital twice when I was using and we did this group, and there was, a, there was a lot of people that engaged in self-harm in this group, and there was a lot of guys and a lot of girls. And all the guys kind of exp explained that, right? Like, I get an endorphin rush, I calm down, I, like, my anxiety goes away. Mm -hmm. But all the girls talked about it, it was more kind of what you're echoing, which is, like, I felt like I needed to punish myself. I feel like it makes me feel alive, and it gets me going more than calms me down. Mm, yeah. And for some reason, it always stuck with me, mm -hmm. that kind of, that difference. And I don't know if that's, like, a biological thing or more of a society thing or I don't know, but... I think it depends just, on, it's just I, I think it depends on, like, me. what you're using it for. And that's kind of, I, that's kind of what I think. Because, like, I, yeah. like I, I was the same thing when I was younger. I was, I was hospitalized for mental health, and, like, I remember going there... And like I had never seen that realm of like mm -hmm. mental health. Like I had struggled with mental health. And I remember there was this little there was this little tiny Asian girl and she wore these hoodies and one day she took it off and she had had like multiple like centimeter cut like all the way up her arm. And I remember it was I asked like like why? And she's like, It's just relaxing. And I remember when I got out, like I cut myself to see what it would feel like and it was like the best feeling in the world. I was like, ooh. I like this. I didn't know that was part of your story. That was part of my story. <clears throat> it was, and it was great. I, I was a cutter probably sophomore year, probably until sophomore year of college. Sophomore wow. high school through college. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. I'd say it's like a drug, too, because yeah. it becomes addicting, that yeah. feeling. Uh, it, you know, it's not, it's different, though, because it's not a numbing no. feeling. It's a release. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a constant, like when you have substances, like you get that and you have at least some type of, of grace period where like you're like, you take it and then you can experience for a certain amount of time. Like it's such a fleeting moment of like mm -hmm. when you do it. And it was hard for me cause like I was an athlete and so like I had to like get, I used to wear like big like sweatpants cause I would always do it like on my inner arm because mm -hmm. I was like, I was too chicken to do it like on my inner thigh or something like that. And like that was the part I could do it. But yeah, it was just this, would happen it was like oh and I need to do it again yeah but I didn't want to have like all these screams so yeah it's it's a it's a it's a weird it's a weird thing but like yeah. it, it totally makes sense when people start to do that for sure yeah. um I also want to say thanks for sharing that I don't think we've had anybody talk about that and I think it's it's a large part of a lot of different people's stories mm -hmm. um so the fact that you're willing to share that with us we really appreciate it. and hopefully that somebody out there knows that they're not the only one doing it and they know that they're they're not alone I think it's important to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to say about it before we kind of move on and talk about your rebellious stage? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah. Totally fine. Yeah. 
Perfect. <laughs> um, okay, so I know eventually you ended up getting, you got a girlfriend, right? And that's kind of when this rebellion of of your, your mom and, and I'm assuming the church um, mm -hmm. kind of started to take place. Walk us through that. Yeah, so my sophomore year, um, I met this girl and, and it was just a different feeling and it, it's that weird awkward stage and I don't know if it's the same as with a guy and a girl you know that weird <laughs> awkward stage is. where you have that feeling because I had had boyfriends before but it was just you know mm. that it's they're just there yeah you know and this was this was different and so you actually got um, butterflies to, in your yeah, stomach, yeah yeah and and so yeah it just kind of naturally happened and um I never got to have that coming out story because my mom had those inklings, you know, those mm. feelings, um, accusatory. And so she did, you know, the big no, no mom thing of going through my room and mm. finding letters and things. Mm. And so it was really interesting because I got accused of it. So, um, at the time we were not together, but it was in the, yeah beginning stages of trying to figure that out yeah you know and so it just kind of gave me that opportunity to okay well did, i am so did you feel like you were kind of raw because you didn't get to come out on your own terms kind of i do because it it made me have to realize mm -hmm. uh, have to uh go through the process i think faster okay and um you know, I always knew I was gay, but to be able to come out to family and then just have that robbed from me, mm -hmm. it it wasn't really fair, but in a way, I guess it made it easier because I didn't have to do that. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, I think it would be hard to, because you didn't get to do it the way that you wanted to do it. That yeah. would be, I can't imagine, right? I've never had to experience anything like that, but I, I can imagine that, that would be really fucking hard. It was very hard very hard um you know it, it was almost like i was in trouble yeah. so you know like uh i mean i got re like you said i got rebellious mm -hmm. you know and so it was almost like i was grounded all the time i i wasn't able you know sophomore year you're getting your driver's license mm -hmm. and so so i can't drive or do anything unless it's going directly to church or taking my brother somewhere for his soccer games or something mm -hmm. and uh yeah, it was just very difficult. So I just felt like I was kind of in prison. Yeah. Well, and then you also had, right, you were part of a pretty conservative religious-based community in your oh, hometown. Yes. So yes. I'm sure that was, it, that added to that imprisonment. Now, were you still in Indiana? I was in Indiana. So yes, very, um, very religious, conservative. Um, even if you're from families that don't go to church, you know, very, can I say Republican? Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, um, conservative um, thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, I would get things once um, people. I didn't really come out in school, but you know, there's always the whispers and and everything. Where I think probably kids from church were told from their parents, mm -hmm. kind like of stay thing. Away from and her then it gets thing. yeah, stay away from her. And so it became pretty lonely my sophomore year, and I really closed off yeah. to most people. And, uh, you know, people would um, scrape things into my locker, you know. And I don't know if that was just because I was gay or if it's the normal teenage thing that people do because. Teenagers are know, brutal. Like, kids bullying, are brutal, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So was there anything else that kind of happened in high school? Anything that you really want to talk about? Anything you want to mention before we kind of move on? Because you went and then because it's straight from 18 you went into the navy right i did yeah so my soft after my sophomore year after um, um my parents knew that i was gay um they decided after that sophomore year to move me out to my dad's to okay. live with my dad um because they thought you know that my girlfriend was the bad influence mm. And so that I would not be gay anymore. So moving me to Seattle area <laughs> would make me not gay. Which is probably more acceptable around here than yeah. it would be in Indiana. Yeah. So my focus became immediately get a job, <clears throat> get through school as fast as possible, get out of the house. Gotcha. You know, and be focused on that. Did you ever, so within the rebellious, you know, actions, 
did substances ever play a part on the way how to cope or manage emotions or you know i it didn't really because i was raised with don't touch that stuff okay because I was told in the family line there's alcoholism, mm. addiction issues, so don't touch that stuff. And I had had experiences, like when I was a six, seven years old, I had a whole bunch of teeth pulled. And I would say that was probably the first time I experienced being high, and I loved it. It was, you know, getting the laughing gas mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, I can remember the whole experience to this day. And it was like, wow, that was the best feeling ever. Yeah. And then having the experience, the history with the self harm and having that addiction, um, in me, I just didn't really touch any substances and I wasn't really around a whole lot of people mm -hmm. that I had that opportunity. Yeah. You know, I wasn't allowed to hang out with those type of people. Um, so it wasn't until, uh, my senior year, I think my dad said that I could have alcohol in the house, uh, but cause he would rather me drink at home mm -hmm. than go out mm -hmm. and party. And so I didn't really drink that takes the fun out of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't yeah. really drink too much, uh, it wasn't until I got into the military that I really got into substance. Yeah. So talk to us about that. Join the Navy. What was that like? Oops. Yeah. So I joined the Navy right after high school. I was uh, early 19. And uh, so older yep. ones that were 21 would bring the alcohol into the barracks. And, you know, I don't think I ever drank normally. Yeah. Ever. I, you know, it was the it's like water, you know, <laughs> vodka and orange juice. Give me the glass, 30, the 32 ounce, you know, mm -hmm. give me a glass and I'll swig it down. And then we're ready to go to the club or yep. go to the beach. And or at that time I was one. in Florida, in Florida and schooling. And yeah, you know, and it was, it wasn't even a drink to just fit in. It was like, this is just what I do. Yeah, you yeah. know, I just never drank normally and uh i thought that's just what you do yeah you know <laughs> yeah totally so which i feel like is like the big social norm within like military because like my both my younger brothers were in the navy mm -hmm. and like that's like i remember talking yeah. to them like i was at syracuse and they were like they're in florida you know finishing up basic training and all that and they're just like yeah all we do is drink we drink yeah. and we go to the beach we drink we go to the beach yeah that's all it was and like when they were out on the ship they're like as soon as we port we go drink and then like we go back so like that's life mm -hmm. yeah yeah well, and it's kind of like the same thing like your life is so structured so when you finally don't have a minute of structured time you want to go just get plastered yeah yeah work hard play play hard yeah totally yeah definitely so, teaches uh, the binge drinking Oh, I bet. Especially yeah, when totally. you get deployed and going on the on the ship, and then when you hit land, mm -hmm. you know, just binge, 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 get all you can. Yep. Go back to work. Yeah, totally. Because you guys can't take that back on the ship, right? You're not supposed S to. Not supposed <laughs> to. Yes, yes. I had some very interesting concoctions. <laughs> Mouthwash getting scent but it's not mouthwash mm -hmm. you know so some very tasty minty raspberry stolies you know <laughs> i would get sent yeah, okay. <laughs> so so is there anything else that happened in the navy was it i'm sure it wasn't uneventful but is there anything that kind of lent itself to your addiction um you did four definitely years, right? fitting in and, and that's the point where people would tell me i was a lot more fun and when i was drinking hmm. because I was pretty socially awkward yeah. and quiet and reserved. And a lot of that had to do with me being gay and, and Your experience not with that. my experience with that and not knowing if I would be accepted or yeah, not. Totally. So curiosity, um, how, like, how was your sexuality accepted within the military? Um, it was pretty accepted. You know, I was in at the time when it was don't ask, don't tell, but you know, everybody knows you just don't talk about it. Yeah. You know, and so uh, it it wasn't 
it wasn't a bad experience. Um, I just didn't really talk about it a whole lot with most people. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so, okay. So finally felt like you had the good experience with alcohol. It sounds like in the Navy, right? Like it was fun. You it were was able to make friends. You were able to talk to people. Lots of drinking, yeah. lots and lots of drinking, you know, piling in the barracks and just sitting there and listening to music and, yep. you know, especially when you're not 21 yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So then what was life like after the Navy? How did so the after progress? the Navy, it progressed um, to, well, I became a wine connoisseur. That was my new thing to kind of hide that is, right. is I'm going to. Classy. Yes. Classy, <laughs> you know. It's a nice Chardonnay. And, mm. Yeah. Pinot you know, Grigio. Yes. <laughs> yep. And, you know, again, it was never just one or two glasses, you know. It was one always. Or two bottles. Way more. Yep. yep. And hiding it, replacing the bottles so that my girlfriend at the time wouldn't really know. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was still hard alcohol in there on okay. the weekends going out. Yep. Um, yeah, I, okay. it was a lot of lot of drinking still, okay. um, but just kind of changed. Yeah, to more isolated it sounds like. Definitely became a lot more isolated once I got out of the military. Okay. Um, I did not go out as much. Okay, and sorry, so how old are you when you got out of the military? I would have been 24, 25. I was in a little bit longer than four years. Okay. So, yeah, I, was, I think it was about 24, okay. 25. Okay. Um, so is there any kind of other – is that just how it was, right? You're just drinking every day, I'm assuming, right? And it's probably progressing and drinking more and more progressing, as the years go and by. Progressing, and there would be periods of time, you know, where I would stop and not drink and, and try to – you know, try to, you know, I'm not going to drink as much, but mm -hmm. you know how that always goes. Moderation. It, it, it progresses again. And then it's like, okay, now I got to stop again. Cause this is not going to be good. And, yeah. and so then it would stop again and then start again. And you know, it, it would ebb and flow with way life, life was going, yeah, totally. how, you know, how good things were going and not going. So was there a time where you ever like, okay, this is out of control. Or was that when you came and got treatment? I would say I did not realize how bad things were until the last three three years or so. Okay. And I just didn't really care anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The alcohol turned to, you know, because of my religious beliefs and stuff, I just, well, and the feeling of knowing how my addiction could be. I never touched anything illegal. So when marijuana became mm. legal in Washington, it was like, okay. And that became my next drug of choice yeah. because it it just took over. Mm -hmm. Well, it's new and exciting. It was new and exciting, yeah. and I didn't have hangovers anymore, and I wasn't throwing up. And so I could felt like felt out. like I could yeah. still function yeah. and stuff. But that's, it's that's totally different. Weed. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's not a blackout, but I don't think I have a lot of memories from the last seven years yep. because, because uh, you know, it's, it I was just a, a zombie. Long? It's been legal for a while. Yeah. Um, Wow. Six, yeah. Holy so, cow. Okay. Yeah, you know, and it's not parsley, you know. It's strong stuff, and, and you know, it took over my life. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I, whenever I would try to stop, the drinking would come back mm -hmm. and come back way worse, you know, and, and I would start getting shakes. And then so it was always a bounce back and forth between the two okay. um, for yeah. years. Totally. Yeah. Um, so – What's, I was, sorry, what is the thing that made you come to North Point? So, um, my wife, um, is also an addict and she, uh, went through some legal problems and ended up in treatment. And so I tried to, um, clean up my act and, and stop and I couldn't, mm -hmm. there, there was just no way, mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought my problem was just at that point marijuana. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped, the drinking became really bad quickly to where I was drinking a fifth every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was getting up in the morning drinking. Uh, if my, my job requires um, some 
traveling and I was where my I was working at the time was really close to home so I would go home on breaks and lunch and drink and and so um it progressed really quickly and luckily she I went to go visit her in treatment and she was like you know I had the shakes and so um I she asked how I was doing and you know I couldn't lie anymore and it was like I wanted her to be able to come home Mm -hmm. so uh, I went in the treatment got an assessment done and um came to north point what were you expecting how did it meet those expectations not meet those expectations um you know i was pretty numb to the feeling Mm -hmm. because it all happened very quickly you know and i was scared i didn't know what i was walking into um but coming into north point it i think i adjusted really quickly and felt at home felt cared for um and that i was going to be able to get the help that i needed good and that's what it's about right finally feeling like we might actually figure something out and get figure it out right yeah yeah um so good things bad things that happened while you're in while you were in north point hopefully not good things bad bad, but maybe not fun yeah you know i don't know about anything bad except for the kind of feeling of being claustrophobic a little bit you know it's yeah. kind of like the navy being on a ship again you know you just have your set schedule <laughs> and this is the time you get up and making your bed and uh going to eating breakfast and and uh going to the different classes and mm-hmm. things and and not getting a whole lot of outside time you know it's a lot more structured and and where you go mm-hmm. is is very limited Mm -hmm. and so i would say that's probably the most difficult part um besides trying to relearn how to socialize Mm. because i had isolated for so long that even though my job requires talking i would say i was even losing the ability at work Mm -hmm. to be able to to talk because i just isolated so much Mm -hmm. when i got home that i didn't know how to communicate whatsoever well and especially communicate sober yeah that too yeah definitely yeah and to be myself Mm -hmm. and enjoy it and have fun and (laughs) laugh and yeah no i that's why i love my job is because i get to see people like and tucker's job right you get to Mm -hmm. see people learn how to do that and go and then they actually have fun and they genuinely have fun not have fun because they're yeah now we're getting dragged to well you're getting dragged too it sounds like (laughs) We're going to be screaming our butts off. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, um, so, and then what were kind of the things that helped um, in early recovery, either like towards the end of North Point or, you know, graduating? What are the Mm -hmm. things that helped and hindered, right? So the things that made made it harder, the things that made it easier. Well, definitely when I first came in here, the first (coughs) thing that happened was I was greeted by by another um, patient that came, Mm -hmm. you know, and they made me feel so welcome. And so I kind of became that that person as soon as somebody came in it's like your family now you know this is north point family and we're all here for each other while we're in here Mm -hmm. out of here you know like we'll be here you know totally in active recovery you know and 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 just building our family you know (laughs) and so i always see that um uh that's and that's what i try to hold dear i you know i come to all the alumni meetings that i that i can when i'm available which i think i've only missed maybe three or four since i've been out and because i feel it's important to give back to north point and to keep the family growing and for the for people that are in an early recovery to know that there are people out there that can do it yeah um and and to grow their family outside um I feel it's really important. Totally. No, I the more support, agree. more support for me. It's kind of a selfish <laughs> yeah. thing, hey, no. but at the Whatever same time, works. you know, it's, it's for them too. Yeah. Definitely. Giving of service too. It, yep. You hit it on the head. Um, so as you left North point, what are the things that you did that you know that you have to do? Like what are the things that are necessary for your recovery, um, then and now? Mm-hmm. Um, and would you recommend for ever other people that, uh, might be going into treatment to think about when they're getting out or people that just got out of treatment or people that are struggling right now, that kind of thing. So uh, after treatment, I went directly into IOP okay. and, um, 
I didn't do the 90 and 90 um, from the very beginning because of working full time also and being an IOP. Um, but now that I'm in like the continuing care type of mm -hmm. um, after IOP where it's only one day a week, um, I've, I'm in the 90 and 90 right now. Okay. Um, like I said, I come to all the Saturday alumni mm -hmm. meetings that mm -hmm. I can, being active um, with the alumni group, um, with the North Point Recovery app. Yep. Um, I Cooper. think I spend more time on that than I do on Facebook. I call that nice. my sober Facebook, you yeah, know, that's because, exactly what it because is. it's all yeah. positive, you mm -hmm. know, and that's all I want in my life is, no is positivity, <laughs> no political things, you know, no, no gossip and negativity, you know, yep. we don't need that. Totally. And, you know, and it, I'm really focusing on myself in the early recovery. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that my wife is she's in early recovery mm -hmm. too so she's um, in an Oxford house mm. and so I'm at home and so it's been kind of a real transition totally um, so for me to have things to do and stay out of the house um, and stay busy and active in my own recovery has been very important totally um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, learning to go bowling that was one of the things that we did when we were in north point was we went for a bowling alley out, outing and so it's one of the things that sometimes we'll do after an alumni meeting and nice. go bowling afterwards or That's awesome. you know um another thing i learned was going to the beach and again mm -hmm. just getting out into nature again because yeah. you know living in a beautiful state and the last six seven years i did nothing Mm -hmm. like nothing and I only live a half hour from the beach you know and the mountains yeah and I did nothing so the last four months I've been spending a lot of time getting out Good. a lot more Good. enjoying the summer I went skydiving nice. everybody's going skydiving now <laughs> everybody I know yeah I'm gonna have to get we're gonna I'm gonna take him we're gonna go yeah definitely not make an not. alumni <laughs> event definitely go skydiving yeah. yeah I don't know if our insurance will cover that <laughs> I don't know if we're, I don't know if we can do well, that. Well, that's true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Making an unofficial. So have to sign a waiver. Unofficial. You, know. <laughs> you well, talk to John Flanagan about that. <laughs> see if he lets that happen. Yeah. So I want to, first of all, I just want to say thank you for being here. I know how intimidating all of this can be. Um, and normally the people, the, the alumni that we have on this guest usually have like two or three years and um you are so well spoken about recovery and about your story mm -hmm. um you could have fooled anybody that you don't you have three years not not four months um not that that isn't an accomplishment at all um and i'm sure you're gonna get there um just keep doing the things that you're doing is there anything you want to say to anybody that might be struggling right now um i know i make it seem like it's it's easy but it has not been easy whatsoever uh i definitely deal with cravings and stuff a lot mm -hmm. um i will say the vivitrol shot helps um will you say say that one more time vivitrol works works <laughs> perfect thank you <laughs> uh and i can say i know that because when i got out you know i got the shot when i got out of treatment but then it took me a while to be able to get it again because my primary care wouldn't do it uh, okay. and so i had to kind of get into a program that took a while and i felt the moment that that was mm. out of my system the naltrexone was out of my system and i dealt with cravings until i got that shot again and if i didn't have the north point family if i didn't go to the meetings do the work yeah. you know i don't i would not have made it because there were times where it's it's struggling, but you can do it. It's it's sometimes from minute to minute, you know, sometimes just sitting there until you can figure out what you're gonna do that's mm. gonna be positive. Um, totally. There were a lot of times where I would just sit and be like, okay, what's my next move? And I would just be on my phone, okay, text the next person. If I don't hear back, text the next person totally. <laughs> until you get somebody to get you out of that funk or get out of it yourself yeah. you know so just but keep building the tools is build that toolbox and use all of them don't stick with just one thing that's right the biggest thing beautiful 
John? I got nothing. I know. She kind of just took all the words we yeah. said. Got it. You're just making us look bad over here. Wow, that's perfect. <laughs> that's what it's all about. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you, Heidi, again. Thank um, you. We're so excited to be out here in Washington. Please, please, please make sure you hit that like button, that subscribe button. It helps us reach so many people. It helps Heidi's story. It helps so many people. We really appreciate it. Once again, this has been No Way But North, where we talk about the miracles of recovery and the tools used to achieve them. Have a good one. Peace. If you or a loved one are struggling with addiction, call 1-877-648-3125. The views and opinions expressed in No Way But North do not reflect those of North Point Recovery or any other institution or organization. 